<laughs> wow. <laughs> this is incredible. So if you're the founder of WordPress, you get a free water during our talk. Would you like one? These are really good. Oh, all right. Thank water. you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Matt, for joining me. Oh, it's a pleasure. I wouldn't miss this. This is uh, quite a venue, the largest WordCamp ever. So congratulations to the entire WordPress European community. Yeah. <laughs> I, I must say, you have set the bar very high for WordCamp US. <laughs> also, just on a more solemn note, like it's beautiful to see uh, so much of Europe coming together on a day where there's a lot of Euroscepticism you know, throughout the Union. So I'm glad everyone's come together here. Absolutely. So Matt, we have an opportunity here to do something that's pretty special in an open source community where we have a co-founder of the project and the lead developer of WordPress here willing and open to answering questions. So we're very happy to have this opportunity. Um, briefly. We have two co-founders here. Mike is here somewhere. Yeah, Mike is here. Hey, Mike. <laughs> There's Mike Little. Mike opened us up this morning with a great story about how he used uh, punch cards in his first programming project. <laughs> Um, that was WordPress 0.72. <laughs> yeah. That's how y'all uh, sent code back and forth to each other? Yeah. <laughs> so I think everyone here knows who you are. However, you wear many hats. You are the CEO of Automatic, Audrey Capital. Mm -hmm. um, you're the co-founder of WordPress, and you run the WordPress Foundation. So I would like to get a little bit into your day-to-day. -day but I'd like to skip the type of life hackery type of stuff that they can find <laughs> on a great Tim Ferriss podcast episode that you did. Thank you. So uh, what do you do when you wake up in the morning? And I know they're, they're not all typical, but what's your, what's your schedule like? And what are the primary things that you check in on? Hmm. Well, obviously, the first stop is post status. Um, <laughs> That's a good stop. <laughs> the, you know, there is almost no typical day in that... Uh, because of wearing very many hats, uh, sometimes it's hard to predict what is going to happen day to day. But also, you know, different things might need di di different attention. So, um, Automatic is obviously, Automatic's now over 470 people in 50 countries. Um, it's a very large enterprise, and running that is more than a full time job. Um, but some of the other things you mentioned, including the foundation, sometimes takes quite a bit of time. Uh, WordPress Core sometimes takes quite a bit of time. Uh, especially more behind the scenes stuff. So all of these. Uh, what I try to do is find wherever I can be most useful and wherever there's something that only I can do, you know? Because otherwise someone else can and should do it and will probably do it much better than I could. Last time we spoke, you told me that you had, I think, 23 direct reports. So people that were uh, talking to you, you're their primary boss. And you said that your goal was 10 people so that you could uh, provide better focus on each of the items that you're How responsible was for. That? <laughs> this was in November of 2015. Mm -hmm. So I was curious, do you have an update on that? And if you've gotten any closer to your goal? I think it's 27 now. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I think we're a little closer to the goal. Uh, but that's just that automatic. It doesn't really count the other responsibilities. So how many people outside of automatic would you say are kind of direct reports? Uh, <laughs> a it's, number. it's not, but that's the thing. Direct report is such like a, a company term and doesn't really encompass uh, what a relationship might entail. So a direct report shows what's on the org chart, but obviously in WordPress, there's not really an org chart in the same way. Um, a direct report might say, you know, again, have the line, but it doesn't necessarily say how much autonomy that team might have or that person or how often you need to connect with them. So if it were uh, a lead on... Jetpack or WordPress.com, I might talk to them, you know, every day-ish mm -hmm. or every other day. Um, where other teams, like let's say our editorial team at Automatic, is much more uh, open, you know? They don't really need to talk to me that often. So even though there's a direct report relationship, it's not necessarily a day-to-day -day time taker. Um, and in general, may... though, to, to answer a question, I try to spend about a, a third of my time on hiring and people. Um, and that spans 
the project, you know, from like recruiting volunteers and working with folks there to uh, obviously hiring people at Automatic. And about a third on product stuff. So call it um, any of the products, of which there is a long list. <laughs> um, sometimes that's WordCamp, sometimes that's .com, sometimes it's Core. And then a third on just whatever the fire of the day is, which is always entertaining. Yeah. Um, it may be a corporate term. However, you are spread thin because of the number of people that you're talking to every day, but also the number of roles that you have in the community. Mm -hmm. And that amount of activity and pressure can lead to burnout. Mm -hmm. So I assume you, like most people, uh, deal with burnout and maybe get sick of WordPress or automatic or whatever. <laughs> um, how do you cope with burnout? You know, I think that, I actually don't believe in the term work-life balance. I think you should try to harmonize. Um, that's something I blogged last year, and it was, uh, I'm going to butcher the quote, but it was roughly find three hobbies. Uh, one to make you money, one to keep you in shape, and one that feeds you creatively, like feeds your soul. And so I think if you can get all of those three going, and I like the word hobbies because it implies that it's something that you would do even if you weren't paid or even if it weren't something, uh, for which participating in WordPress is for probably the vast majority of people here in this room. Um, so that's basically how I try to do it. You know, I try to uh, run or exercise as frequently as possible. Um, you said no life hack stuff, but I do like a few little things every morning. Uh, I read. Actually, just last night, I was up a little bit too late, but I, um, has anyone read the book Dune? Wow. I literally just finished it last night. I know I'm like 20 years late to this. <laughs> That's the amazing thing about books, though. There's always going to be more books you haven't read. Um, that was an incredible story. And so that I find incredibly helpful. And um, yeah, so I, I don't think that as long as you're cognizant and self-aware, you can avoid burnout just by you know, knowing where your energy levels are every day. It's one of the reasons I wear a Fitbit is not to track how few steps I take per day, but to track my sleep. Mm -hmm. Because I find my sleep has a huge impact on how the rest of the day is going to go. Amongst all these other activities, uh, you promised at the State of the Word uh, that you would learn JavaScript mm -hmm. this year. So we're just over halfway through your allotted time to, to learn JavaScript. So okay. I'd like to get a report card on how that's going. So that's actually not too bad. Um, hmm. Well, but how do you know? <laughs> I won't quiz you. I don't think that's a good interview method. Calypso is open source, so I'll see if I can get a commit in Calypso before the state of the world this year. Okay. Um, and speaking of Calypso, we talked last time about engagement and how at Automatic and with WordPress.com, you are willing to try whatever you can to increase engagement. Mm -hmm. And you told me a statistic that was uh, a little depressing to hear. Um, because I think that it translates from WordPress.com and WordPress.org as well. And that was that only about 4% of users uh, stick with their blogs. And mm -hmm. you wanted to move the needle. And that was one of the primary motivations for coming up with Calypso and putting in a significant investment there. So quite a few months on now, mm -hmm. has it moved the needle? That number has moved, but I don't think that... The 4% is actually high if you consider all the people who maybe went to WordPress.org and opened the zip file and were left with a bunch of things on their desktop and had no idea what to do. You know, that's counting from, that's just counting .com at a certain point in the funnel and a few hosts that we've worked with to look at their onboarding process. So the, the reality is that to truly achieve our mission of democracy and publishing, we have to think about every single aspect of it from what do people find when they search YouTube for WordPress to, uh, of course, something very relevant here and something we've made huge strides in in the past year is, is it available in a language that they speak natively? Um, all of these things, it's incredibly challenging because when you think about the entire experience of someone having an idea or a problem and WordPress being the medium through which they are able to solve that, whether that's publishing, selling something online, um, making a brochure, a website, blogging, uh, sharing their story, any of these things. Uh, again, WordPress is a means to an end. And the more that we can enable people, the more we can lower the friction, the better. And I do believe that 
You know, we're at a juncture point. This is why I said to learn JavaScript deeply, and I will repeat it here. <laughs> I actually um, own the domain javascriptdeeply.com, ah. just as a backup plan for post-status. <laughs> Where does it direct to? Uh, I think a blank page on post-status, so I didn't market that too well. Oh, uh, yeah, you should redirect it to like a tutorial or a book or something, because yeah. that would be fun to refer to. The, I do truly believe that we're at a juncture point where the way the interface of WordPress is written is not going to be what most people use to publish in 10 years. Now, whether they use WordPress to publish in 10 years or not depends on if over that time we're able to adapt and evolve uh, the way that we do things and the way we, that we write uh, to be the thing that people are going to use. And, you know, I think that some people might have thought when I said learn JavaScript deeply when Calypso came out, that was like something that would happen in the next year or two. When I think of WordPress, I think of decades. And over the next five years, um, every developer in this room is going to need to learn JavaScript deeply. You know, uh, The thing that people interact with is going to be more of an application model than the document model and the you know, bunch of .php files we have in WP Admin. That's just not going to be how most people interact and publish. So. And what that looks like beyond that, we need to figure out and we need to create. And I do think most people agree that learning JavaScript is a tool for a broader goal of making a, a better writing experience, a better publishing experience with WordPress. And you actually uh, said the word medium, so I'll use that as my as a segue. <laughs> um, WordPress in its early days, when it was competing against movable type and Drupal and Joomla and other platforms, it was the easy thing to use on the block, the thing that made hmm. publishing easier, made updates easier, and with uh, a more social web and also just a greater demand for ease of use in our tools, we've seen other tools pop up. Uh, at one point, we probably overreacted a little bit to Tumblr um, and some of the ease of publishing that it created. And now we're seeing Medium really rise to today's demands in publishing. Um, for instance, the ringer.com just launched on Medium, which is mm -hmm. the type of uh, project that we would have celebrated coming to WordPress several <laughs> years ago. Um, and there are, are a number of publishers that are going to something like Medium. And it doesn't seem like just a fad. I saw an article recently on Neiman Lab that mm -hmm. was talking mm -hmm. about a number of publishers that had moved to Medium. And the uh, editor, whoever it is in charge of the Pacific Standard, Nicholas Jackson, said WordPress is a nightmare, <laughs> and Medium helps them solve a lot of the problems. And they're obviously doing some things right in the content editing perspective. So what is the threat that Medium or similar tools provide, and how do we improve? That was like 14 questions. Yeah. So there's a number of things I'm going to unpack. This is my first live Matt interview, so. <laughs> You're going to get it all in. Yeah. Um, a number of publishers. The number was about five, which is the number that were in the Neiman Labs. What the Neiman Labs article did not mention, uh, but if you check out, I just retweeted something from Mark Armstrong, who is the founder of Long Reads. Um, they're paying those people to switch. <laughs> they are, but you also actively recruited people that were on uh, movable type to use WordPress as well. So it may not have been... Didn't pay them. <laughs> may not have been monetary, I mean, but that's it was the active thing. recruitment. Millions of dollars is going to uh, the ringer. Um, they are promised and guaranteed revenue. So I think that you have to look at this from the point of view not that they've gotten five people and they're making a great deal about it, five publishers, um, but that they were like on WP Engine or WordPress VIP or something like that, people pay tens of thousands of dollars to use WordPress. And on Medium right now, they're being paid to use WordPress. Do you think uh, WordPress is a better publishing experience than Medium right now? Without a doubt, absolutely. Um, so you said ease of use, but in reality, Blogger, has always been easier. There's been a number of tools that perhaps you could say have fewer steps to publish than WordPress does. What WordPress has always thrived is in two things. Uh, it's flexibility, meaning you can do anything with it. Um, and the community. You know, the fact that there is such a, and that manifests itself in the plugins and the themes and the developers and everyone here in this room. Those are the two things that WordPress has done over the past decade better than every other person out there, which is where our market share has grown commiserately. Um, w Medium has an amazing WYSIWYG and a great editor. Uh, however, there's no themes. Your site looks generic like every other one on there. Uh, in Mark's post, he has a screenshot of the ringer. 
where all you can tell that it's the ringer is like this little R in the top left. The rest is a sign-up button for Medium, a follow button that requires you to sign up for Medium. Um, they essentially have outsourced their entire future of their business in many ways to this platform, which does not have a business model and is not certain uh, how they're going to monetize, if they're going to monetize, and what effect that will have on both their readers and their publishers. So, you know, I believe, and I would think that most WordPress users would believe, that you should control your destiny in that regard. That if you're going to have followers, you should be able to export those followers and switch them to another platform. You should have good permalinks. Medium has terrible permalinks. <laughs> <laughs> you should have all of these things that allow you to uh, be in control of your digital destiny. Um, which, sort of trading off freedom for convenience on these platforms, um, you know, there's people who chose to publish purely on MySpace. People who chose to publish purely on AOL. You know, there's people who have made these decisions over the days. Media companies, I think, are particularly challenged because they are being completely disintermediated by the aggregators, by Twitter, by Facebook, by Google. Um, they typically don't have or the ability to hire or retain great tech talent. And um, so when someone comes to them with a sort of an offer to take care of everything. And if you read the Neiman Labs article, you see that literally the core developers of Medium were switching each person over one by one, requiring no development side on there or investment on their side. Um, they'll take it and they'll try it, and I think they should try it. The other essay you should read here is called Billionaire's Typewriter. So just Google it, check it out. It explains many of these things far more eloquently than I have. One of the, uh, one of the reasons people have flocked to consuming content and creating content on some of these social tools is because it is significantly easier. Um, mm -hmm. But it's not open. Some, well, some of the challenges that we have in the open web, for instance, even using WordPress, dealing with spam mm -hmm. uh, comments and dealing with managing statistics and things like that, that a closed web can perform much better. Uh, Automatic has monetized these closed components to the, your business. Um, through Kismet and Jetpack and other services that power some stuff behind the open web. Is the open web, in terms of being able to make awesome stuff with it, under threat because of the ease of use and uh, the great user experience that you can create when it's a more isolated experience? So, in many ways, the open web is more important than ever before. If you imagined, imagine your tweet stream or your Facebook news feed, and then imagine none of the links out. That's basically instant articles, isn't it? <laughs> no, 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 but it, that comes, instant articles comes from the web. Like, that is supported by the business models of For the now. open web, everything. <laughs> um, think how many companies started to do only mobile apps and then all made web versions, you know? We're at a point when the independence afforded by the web is perhaps reached a nadir and is now coming back. So, of course, from a user experience point of view, uh, it behooves a host that's trying to provide kind of a unified experience to worry about things like spam, backups, and security. Because it's true that if you signed up for Squarespace today, they don't charge you extra to not get spam. <laughs> they don't charge you extra to, you know, have a backup of your site. Um, so I do think that its hosts are going to need to bundle more and more of these things whether they develop themselves or partner with someone else. Uh, but that's more from the user experience point of view. The truth, you know, you made fun of Tumblr a little bit. I did. <laughs> I don't think it's that good. Uh, Tumblr, from a publishing point of view, is still the best competitor we've had in the past five years. If the first five or six years of WordPress are competitor, best competitor was maybe movable type or typepad, Really, Tumblr, and if you look at it, even Tumblr under Yahoo and its decline since the day it sold is still 80 to 100 times bigger than Medium, which is now five years old. Like, they have actually captured something in a real way that even though it's perhaps not in the zeitgeist as much, I think that they really nailed something with their tool. And I was very sad when they sold because we lost a very good competitor. Yeah. And I think that we probably still have more to learn, uh, even from the old Tumblr. Well, you never know. Maybe the founders can buy it back. I've heard that's happened with Yahoo products before. <laughs> um, when we've talked before, you've put automatic revenue into three buckets. 
Um, and you were talking about other companies' revenue sources. And Automatic, last time you raised money, had a $1.6 billion valuation. Eventually, that means that you make money to help those investors uh, recoup their investment. Like eventually. Yeah. Eventually. Um, you listed those buckets as WordPress.com, Jetpack, and uh, what was it? WooCommerce. WooCommerce, yeah. For a year now, uh, under the, under the mm -hmm. Automatic umbrella. Which of those buckets is biggest for Automatic right now, and where do you see the most growth? Sure. Uh, our buckets are still the same. We've added one additional one, which is, as some of you might have heard, in November, we are launching the .blog TLD, which I'm very excited about. It's big enough to be a bucket. It's, it's big enough to be a bucket. You yeah. paid 19 to 20 million, I uh, uh, saw for that. I can't officially say, but... <laughs> to be fair, though, you put that on your blog and then removed it, but it stayed on Facebook. Hot tip. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely keep a lot of lawyers in business. <laughs> <laughs> um, so where, where do you see the most growth from these four buckets? Or which, which of the three is your biggest revenue source right now? I honestly believe that the first three have the ability to be multi-billion dollar businesses each on their own. And that blog could be a multi-hundred million dollar business. Um, where they are ordered right now, it's kind of in the order you said them. I believe it's .com, no, woo, .com, woo, Jetpack, and .blog obviously makes zero dollars right now, so. And where do you see the most growth potential? I think there's a huge growth potential in all of them, otherwise we wouldn't be in them. Um, what I like about each of those four businesses is that they're one, complementary to each other, um, and two, complementary to the community at large. So the way that I've tried to structure all my commercial enterprises is to make them that, even if I were no longer at the guiding them or at the head, that uh, as they succeed, that they give far more back to the broader WordPress community than they make or take themselves. And um, I think this is a model uh, for enterprise and capitalism in general that I could see being uh, far more prevalent than it is. And I, one of the things I'm most proud of is how many of the companies in the WordPress ecosystem do exactly that. They give so much more back to the community than uh, they make in revenue or they you know, make from the world. WordPress is 13 years old, mm -hmm. so congratulations. Uh, I have a teenager. Yeah. You have a teenager. <laughs> we all have a teenager, so we all gotta. <laughs> We're at a bit of a, of a crossing point with WordPress where it has to decide what it wants to be when it grows up. Um, Did you decide that when you were 13? Uh, pretty close. <laughs> I was a weird kid, though. I'm going to be a WordPress blogger. And <laughs> well, it never really turned into that. I decided on what I wanted to major in in college, but this interview is not about me. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to know, what is your vision for WordPress? You know, the thing I keep coming back to, and it's a little cheesy and a little abstract, but... WordPress really can be an operating system for not just the web, but the open web. And I think by, one of the things that I love about as we grow and as we become more successful and gain more of that market share is that we shift the web to be more open just by dint of the things built into WordPress, the APIs, the way we do everything, feeds. Um, Twitter no longer has RSS feeds. <laughs> it's crazy. Medium blocks the WordPress user agent. They literally block WordPress from accessing Medium in their code. There's all these things that um, the web, <sighs> I mean, if you, you know, we talked a little bit about the politics that went on in Britain today. Um, in the US, we're seeing this Trumpism, right? Uh, wow, that was a noise. <laughs> There's a segment of the population that's feeling left out. Uh, from the economic growth and development of the past 20 years. Um, there is a segment of the population, I think rightly, is impatient and unhappy with the way, you know, unfettered corporate entities have taken and given back to the world at large, environmentally, uh, socially, ethically in some cases. And we essentially have... So, you know, whether it's the Brexit, Trump, or Bernie Sanders, 
who I identified much more with, um, I think you have some very valid criticisms of the status quo and the way things have been done. The, but the way to where a reaction to that could be to sort of close yourself off and go inward or, you know, xenophobia, whatever it might be, that drives some of these nationalistic or xenophobic tendencies, I think a far more powerful way to address these problems is through being radically open and through in the words of someone far better, uh, be the change you want to see in the world. And with WordPress, we have the ability, each of us actually, to create our own vision of how we want the web to be, the web you want your children to have. And that's why we should and must think about things as a multi-decade endeavor. I think we have an opportunity to create software um, that is around in 50 years, that is around in 100 years, in a way that's completely unrecognizable to us now, but that is a force uh, for good and for openness on the web and in the world, because the web becomes the world. Practically, to take this vision, which is a noble one, and to translate that to software, lines of code that we write, mm -hmm. um, it requires translation of sorts. Lines uh, of JavaScript that we write? Lines of JavaScript, <laughs> uh, maybe quite a few, and you have to translate this broad vision and make it a more narrow vision and turn it into project goals. Mm -hmm. WordPress right now, we have six lead developers. Mm -hmm. um, at times, you have different strength in your voices. Sometimes you don't use them as much, and there's maybe one or two lead developers that's more influential. But even still, in the lead developer role, it's not a lead of product, a lead of implementing the broader vision that you have. Mm -hmm. So my question is, do we need a product lead for WordPress.org. Well, for WordPress.org, the website, perhaps. For WordPress, WordPress the, software, the software. That is the, I think, beauty of the release lead model, is that we, and what we've done now over how many releases? Have we had release leads? Eight, nine? Um, is basically give the ability for a lead to have autonomy and authority over everything that goes into that release. But the release um, itself is pretty temporary, usually about a four-month period where maybe just a few weeks is the actual visionary tenure. Well, that's where it is on the schedule, but the reality is that that's the culmination of things that have happened over the past six to 18 months before. You know, the infrastructure that have been put in place to enable things being built in the future. So I think that what's interesting is that... Uh, now, I think you complete, could completely say that we should think further ahead. And that's part of the reason that we've been designating the release leads further ahead of the release coming on its head. And um, I'm very sad that I won't get to lead one this year, because I was excited about that. But the role of the release lead, and lead developers in general, is you know, probably the best way to think of it as editorial. So you don't think that we need a more broad vision product lead, someone to create more structure and implement some of your big vision I think that the big vision is getting implemented. I actually am not concerned about that. Um, and when you look at what actually drives the adoption of WordPress, we actually have product, we have leads of hundreds of visions through plugins that are doing amazing things. Like if you look at, this is one thing I want to do in the plugin directory is, you know, there's some plugins that are kind of hello dollies, right? That just kind of make a minor tweak. There's some plugins that are completely behind the scenes, there's some plugins that affect your themes, but there's a class of plugins that are essentially applications of the, you know, complexity and power of WordPress itself. They're built on WordPress as an operating system, um, what I used to call the content management kernel, you know? And if you think of a Woo or a Yoast or a Gravity Forms or Contact Forms, like these plugins are amazing and what is beautiful about our structure is that it allows you to have this base, which gets better with every single release, and then mix and match the sort of visions that you want to bring into it. And the jambalaya or gumbo that you create is unique to you and tailored perfectly to your needs. It's not a one-size-fits-all. It's not an off-the-shelf SaaS solution. It is really and with Jetpack, we try to give you the best of both worlds, of both cloud and self-hosted. So you have control and the cloud power. The, this is not something that's out there right now in any other products. 
And I think it's why that even though, let's say a Wix and a Squarespace between them are spending $200 million this year advertising against WordPress, mm -hmm. that they have to. That our competitors are having to spend hundreds of millions of dollars advertising or literally paying users to come over to them. While organically, WordPress is you know, doing well. We could do much better, and we have so much work to do. Please don't let anyone think that I don't believe that. But the, uh, it's, it's coming along pretty nicely. I mean, we're at 26% now. For several years, WordPress has been very iterative. Um, mm -hmm. And I do think there's merit to that. Getting big features, getting to that point where there's community buy-in to say, this belongs in core. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a difficult process right now. I think I've heard from a lot of committers even, a lot of um, people that have led releases, and I think without some form of Matt stamp of approval saying, this shall go, uh, it can feel challenging to muster up the, uh, the momentum that's required for, for one of these good ideas to actually go into core. So how do we, how do we get that past that? I think our challenge is in the lack or presence of a Matt stamp of approval, uh, as evidenced by how long it took MP6 to come into core. <laughs> but it, it steamrolled <laughs> nonetheless, maybe a little a slower than you wanted. No, it took a year. And to be honest, from like a software development point of view, it should have taken three months. Um, so I think that's what we have to look at. Um, that's where we can give in the project, and particularly in our organizational structures, more authority to people to make decisions. Um, not that decisions should come to me. That's not how any great product or any great company or any great organization works. Uh, although, like, I'm flattered <laughs> that you think that me just making lots of decisions will I, I change the course of WordPress. The reality is that what we need is we can't have decisions by community or consensus, you know, because then when there's something that comes up, uh, this happened with polyglots the other day. I said, well, who will make this decision? And it's, well, the group of us do. Well, who's in the group? Well, whoever shows up to that meeting. How do you decide? Well, we kind of vote on it in Slack. Like, these things, I think, work for small, iterative things, but are more challenging to push through bigger things or do experiments or do things that are risky, right? Because in some ways, that structure rewards things that are not going to fail. So it's not that we can't continue to grow, perhaps even as fast as we have, through that model of decision making, but that what the, the Gordian knot that the release lead structure tries to you know, cut through. And the other things we can do, we can probably think about our organizational design more. And I'm excited for people to chat about this at the community day here at WordCamp Europe. Um, to perhaps allow more speed and, um, and iteration. Because the reality is, it's just code. There is basically nothing we can't undo or roll back. It is and just code, but there are oftentimes hundreds of hours that go into those projects. Not to say that that should be automatically what makes it go in, but I'd like to use a quick example sure. of improving the content editing experience. There were ideas for content blocks and front-end editing and the customizer. Mm -hmm. Each have their own positives and potential negatives. Um, whose role is it to help decide, let's go after this, and let's make mm -hmm. this the future of how you publish in WordPress? Because that's the type of thing where I feel like we're held back right now in our one administrative writing box that we have, and we could benefit from a more immersive writing experience. But those are three pretty different directions. Could a product lead or uh, a more involved in the day-to-day, -day, Matt, you don't have time for mm -hmm. that as much. How do, how, do, how do those types of big top-level decisions happen? I feel like you have an answer kind of embedded in your questions. I don't. <laughs> I'm looking forward to your answer. Um, I think it's completely fine. Like, I think it's important that we consider things that seem even completely against our orthodoxy or the complete opposite of what we've done before. Um, so I'm happy to consider what you're suggesting. Uh, appointing someone, I guess, above release leads that drives things across releases, is that kind of the crux of it? Yeah, somebody across release leads. Someone to more uh, fervently implement the vision that you set. Yeah. I I guess that isn't necessarily what's worked well for us in the past. We could consider and then discuss it. 
Uh, but right now, the practical answer to what you said is that the release lead has the autonomy and the authority to do those sorts of things. Um, my role when I'm not a release lead is to support them however possible. And you know, the best release leads have come to me and said, I need more resources here, or I need more help with this. And I do whatever I can to get that for them. Or if they're stuck with something, if I can use uh, my accidental unfortunate role as a co-founder of the project to help move something forward, I will absolutely do that to help them. Um, but the exact idea is to give them a chapter of the book that they can write, you know? And the continuity with previous chapters and the coherence with what we've set out as a vision for the future, which I actually think there's more unity among the lead developers than you might assume, um, even though we disagree on many other things, uh, is, is that kind of is part of the job. And I've been very, very happy with a lot of the releases that have come out since we've attempted this model. We're going to move on to audience questions in just a second. And while I look those up, I'd like this to... The audience is amazing, by the way. This is an <laughs> awesome room. And there's an entire other room? There's a whole other room and the live stream. Oh my goodness. Hey, other room. <laughs> so I'd like, to, I'd like to ask while I'm going to these other questions uh, about auto updates. Uh -huh. Updates are hard. They're still hard for WordPress. And I recently looked at the philosophy page on WordPress and we talked about how great it was to have one-click updates. But today people really don't like updating things at all. I know don't like, like, when I went yeah. to... Uh, Seem, you know, auto updates on my phone, I never missed going to that page and pressing update. So <laughs> when are we going to move beyond minor versions for auto updates in WordPress and have a more chromey style update experience? It's a topic we're going to be talking about on Sunday, I believe. So, you know, find Dion, find Nason, and uh, bring your crazy ideas. It's challenging, you know, because it's not... Um, we're not running on desktops, we're running on servers. And servers have a lot of variables, and there's security aspects, there's compatibility aspects, and how people can modify WordPress goes far beyond how people can and do modify Chrome. And if we break it, it's not something you see necessarily right away on your desktop when you launch your browser. It's something that maybe your store goes down, and you lose thousands of dollars for every hour that your store is down in sales. Or, you know, there's a lot of important parts of the internet, <laughs> a quarter of it. Is, uh, is reliant on us doing this well. So I think it's absolutely right for us to be cautious there, especially when the ability to move more aggressively here is in the hands of the host, whether that's your hosting yourself or the WordPress-focused host or the more larger generic host for whom WordPress is more than half of their customers usually. Uh, and they've done actually some pretty awesome work here. Our first question from the audience comes from David Bissett, who said, oh, cool. where did you get that sweet ring and when are the knockoffs appearing in the swag store? Ah. And for reference, this made the rounds <laughs> on Twitter last night. Matt has a WordPress uh, wedding band of sorts <laughs> and said last night that he is married to the game. <laughs> <sighs> this is a prototype. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been kind of beta testing it. Coming to a swag um, store near you? I like it a lot. But it is, uh, it's big. It's, um, I think it really only worked for men. Like it's... It's too large, so uh, we're going to try some other designs, and we'll see what pops up All right. for other people who are married to the game. I hope I get these names right. This should be more WordPress jewelry, right? <laughs> <laughs> Nilambar Sharma said, what advice do you have for theme and plug-in companies um, to accord with the direction of WordPress in the future, especially all the way through the next five years even? Um, I will give two key pieces, one for each constituency. If you are a theme developer, uh, right now I think one of the biggest gaps between the promise and reality of using WordPress is when you see that theme demo and you try to make your site look like that. <laughs> uh, so think about that. Um, that is an extraordinarily important part of the WordPress user experience, completely outside of core in many regards, and um, work on that. And I think that I've not seen a theme that does it perfectly yet. And I think we all have some room to improve there. So um, really give that some thought and talk to your users, talk to your customers, work with them, look at it. Uh, think about documentation, think about videos, think about whatever you can do to help them close that gap. And think about what we can do in core to help you close that gap. Um, to preempt a future question, I agree that demos on WordPress.org should be better. So. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Uh, for plugin authors, 
I will say, I'll reiterate what I said at the State of the Word in uh, December, that I believe that the future is JavaScript interfaces talking to APIs. Um, all of the scaffolding, everything is there in WordPress core today to shift your plugin to be API driven. Um, we're, you know, living what we preach and WooCommerce is doing a big interface rewrite around this now. Jetpack is doing a big interface rewrite, both using React um, and they're, they're doing it. So uh, I think that I've heard a few others of the large plugins are doing it. I don't want to out anyone that might, have, might not have announced it yet, but uh, if you're not working on that yet and you are either an app plugin or you have a significant interface that's in WP Admin, uh, that will best sort of position you, I think, to make the transitions that we're going to over the next five years. Speaking of that, someone named Pablo asked, what is stopping or slowing down the merge of the REST API into core? And I believe they are referencing the endpoints rather than the infrastructure, which went into core in 4.4. Yeah, I think that in terms of the endpoints, they need work. So <laughs> it's not one specific thing. And you know, there's nothing that I'm going to say on stage that I haven't already said in the Slack meetings or other places. So uh, we are running the endpoints now on WordPress.com. So there are tens of millions, close to 100 million sites that you can develop things against these endpoints. Uh, not to mention everyone running the plugin already. So there is a large cohort of sites in the wild. Um, certainly on the .com ones, we're not seeing a ton of usage of the APIs yet. And I think what's tricky, I mean, we knew this was going to be hard <laughs> because there's so many constituencies that are being served by the APIs. There are um, sophisticated WordPress agencies and developers who are using to integrate you know, with essentially custom developed bespoke applications. There are you know, web crawlers that want to access WordPress content differently. There are our own mobile clients. There are broader other applications that want to integrate with WordPress. Like let's say you have a WordPress button on YouTube that lets you post to your blog. So there's all of these different use cases, all of which have challenges. And I would say particularly authentication is one that is proving to be incredibly difficult to do in an open web distributed way. Um, if you want to check out something pretty cool that perhaps could change the f what a future WordPress looks like, um, check out the interplanetary file system. The I'm not making up that name. Interplanetary file system. It was not in Dune. <laughs> it's a real thing. Um, but I think there will be something inspired by blockchain technology, inspired by the distributed nature afforded by the incredible power that Moore's Law is giving to all of our devices that will allow a more massively distributed application set that bypasses many of the problems that we're having right now, where the web sort of naively assumed openness and distribution in ways that end up not being that user-friendly, like DNS, domains, etc. So uh, check this out, because there's some stuff there that maybe beyond the next five years after we rewrite everything in JavaScript could be an interesting direction for WordPress to enable. Peter from WP Pusher asked, if you were starting a business around WordPress from scratch, what area would you get into today? Not. Not WordPress? <laughs> Not uh, e-commerce or... Um, <laughs> if it weren't going to be one of the things automatic we're currently in, ah, uh, huh. I'd probably work on... So the site builder aspect, you know, so the idea of the customization going beyond what the customizer or themes do and um, a way to do that in a clean code and open way. Luis Herans said that a year ago you said you want WordPress to run 50% of the web. Mm -hmm. Is WordPress.org an important part of the plan? And if so, how is the automatic helping WordPress.org to make this happen? Yeah, so WordPress.org is a centralized hub for many things that we do. Um, I certainly don't mind when it's a centralized hub for things like development or things like the folks here in this room. I think that's okay. I get more nervous about inserting it as a choke point or a single point of failure for the tens of millions of WordPresses out there, for many of whom the beautiful thing about them is that they're independent and not dependent on any centralized service. Um, also just that creating a sustainable model for supporting that infrastructure. 
uh, can be challenging, particularly in the near term. So that's why I'm hesitant about those things. Um, I certainly think as a community hub, as sort of our town square where we gather and drink and have fun and work together and do everything, um, WordPress is central to that. But when we start to get into things like authentication for the API, that's where I get a lot more pause. And I think that's a decision that we should make much more deliberately if we're going to go down that path. Because it does put WordPress as both a single point of failure, also a point of security um, that we ha would have to protect to protect every other WordPress site in the world um, to think about. XK. 